see them on the screen there. And I'm just going to pause to admit a few more people. Okay, so you can see that really through the duration of the webinar, if you don't mind keeping your camera and your microphone off so we can focus on, on the speakers, that would be great. If you have any questions for the uh, for the speakers, please submit them using the, uh, the chat function, uh, either on Zoom or on YouTube, and we will get to as many of those questions as, as possible. Please be respectful to all. Um, we're not here to agree with each other, um, but definitely we're not here to fight each other either. So just, just um, let's agree to disagree and let's express opinions, but always in a respectful way. And by all means, please comment on social media. Um, we're very keen for you to, to get the word out. All right, now let me also explain how the session is going to run. I'm gonna start by introducing the two speakers uh, and then each of them will have about 10 minutes to present around the topic of play. Uh, and I tell you what, they've got a lot of things to say. Uh, and after that, we'll open for a chat, for a conversation between them uh, and myself, but then also we'll open to your questions, okay? All right, so who do we have here today? First up, we're gonna have, we're gonna have Orla Farmer, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna try and keep this short, but there is a lot that I could say about Orla. Uh, first up, she's a qualified PE teacher, okay? But she's, uh, she's now, uh, her main occupation at the moment is as a part-time lecturer in the early years and early childhood uh, department at Dundalk uh, Institute of Technology in Ireland. Uh, but also she's in, her, in the last year of her PhD. In fact, she's going to be presenting, submitting her thesis in the next two or three weeks. So this is a very tense moment for, for Orla. Um, and she's doing that at University College in Cork. Um, her research has been around the Gay League for Girls program, uh, but she will tell you a lot more about that. Uh, and uh, because of that research, really, Orla has been in, in very high demand over the last uh, few months. Uh, and she's presented at many conferences internationally. Orla also happens to be an incredible athlete herself. Uh, she plays for the Cork Senior Ladies, uh, who can be classed as the Barcelona of uh, Gaelic uh, women's football. Um, they've won, uh, at some time, at some point, they won six championships in a row, six all Ireland championships in a row. So a lot of tiki-taka Gaelic football uh, that went on there. Um, and, that, and that's Orla. I'm gonna now introduce uh, Owen, um, Owen Mooney is what we would call one of uh, one of the apostles of um, of iCoach Kids. Owen is currently the Learning and Games Development Coordinator for the Dublin GAA, but he has also in the past been National Coach and a Sport Development Coordinator for the Special Olympics in Ireland, and the Games Development Officer at the Rockland Gaelic Athletic Association Club in New York, in the USA. He has a real passion for learning and has a very keen interest in physical literacy, child development, coach education, and generally in assisting sports and clubs to implement sustainable development plans. He's also presented at local, national, and international conferences in Ireland, the UK, and the United States, uh, and has been a coach developer for over 10 years. Owen happens to be doing currently a doctorate in professional practice uh, at Leeds Beckett University. And his research is centered around two main themes, uh, finding more about the voice of the child in relation to how we use play in, in sport, but also understanding more coaches' perspective around the use of play. I'm not gonna say any more. They're gonna tell you a lot about themselves. So I'm gonna straight over hand over to Orla. Orla, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, and it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to contribute to this webinar um, and share some insights from, I suppose, my own perspective as a researcher, uh, but also as a player um, and also as a coach as well. Um, I suppose I, you know, as Sergio was saying, I'm coming towards the end of my PhD journey now. Um, I'm hoping to submit in the next two weeks. And my research focuses specifically on female youth sport participation. So I'm going to share some of the play-based approaches and the insights as part of my intervention. Um, I suppose just to generate discussion and I suppose share my findings from a Gaelic Games perspective in Ireland. Um, and then I'll just finish with my own perspective. So, you know, I've been playing uh, at, at an elite level myself 
the last few years, 10 years now I'm playing on, on the senior panel. Um, so I think it's nice to actually merge the research side to it, but also actually like have to experience that myself um, and share those insights as a player um, and how I've experienced the whole notion of play, um, both in training and both in games. So um, I'll just kick off really first by just starting um, just to give a bit of a background on Gaelic for Girls and my research. Um, so Gaelic for Girls is a national run ladies Gaelic football programme um, and it's, it's run by the LGFA in Ireland um, and it targets eight to 12 year old girls. So the purpose of the programme is to try and recruit girls um, and introduce girls to ladies football in, I suppose, a non-competitive fun manner whereby they, they introduce the skills of ladies football with the hope that they would join a club and continue playing ladies football and keep physically active. So I started my PhD journey four years ago now um, and uh, I'm, I, I've put an evidence base behind the program so in order to, to tailor the program and to improve the program to get more girls active. So um, how the Gaelic for Girls program works is that it's run over 12 weeks, just to put it into context for you. Um, and every week the girls come to the training session. It's an hour long. Um, and after the eight weeks of the program, they have a choice of joining the club. So within that hour, every week, the girls are exposed to a variety of um, game-based approach, station-based approach. So um, primarily through the teaching, for, uh, teaching games for understanding approach. Um, but with my research, I kind of tailored that based on my findings. So one of the main findings that was coming through in my research was that of, you know, when, when, when the girls were asked, you know, why are they, why are they playing sport and why are they involved and why do they like football? The, the biggest barrier or the, sorry, the biggest motivators that were coming through were that of fun and friendships. So, you know, that aligns with research in Ireland and internationally as well, the whole fun and the social aspect of sport. So I suppose, you know, thinking on those findings, it was something I had to do was, okay, how am I going to implement that now, even more so into the Gaelic for Girls programme? So another finding that came through was that of, um, of the, the choice. You know, girls wanted a choice and they wanted that autonomy structure in, in the sense that they wanted a say, uh, which Owen is going to speak about as well in, in terms of giving you know, players a voice. So fun friends, more choice in, in the games. This was coming through in the baseline findings. So what I decided to implement in my, in my research as part of the Gaelic for Girls programme was as part of the station-based approach, I implemented a team, a specific team challenges station so 10 minutes every week the girls were ex were exposed to a variety of different team games but they got to choose what games they wanted to play but they also had a chance to interact with each other and kind of get that you know communicative play and the social play and not just you know the coach saying right we're going to do this now we're going to do that next we're going to do this after so girls actually got that opportunity to to interact with each other and i suppose to communicate and come up with their own solutions so as part of the the team challenges um they weren't told exactly how to go about doing the team challenges um, okay the end the end goal was was explained but it was up to the team to communicate with each other and it was up to the girls to to see okay what's going to work best because the team that worked best together you know will will we'll get the end result and it wasn't about competition it wasn't about who's going to get there first it was all about that communicative social play which worked really really well and the, the findings that were coming through from the focus groups was that of the fun and the friendship and they, they liked the fact that you know it wasn't yeah. necessarily it's football when you watch the video would you like to do class de Marie-Ève or or uh english written or more or... i'm not sure there would be a second oh yeah okay then we... yeah, carry on Ola, carry on yeah, no no problem um so as part of the team, the specific team challenge station, um, the girls got that opportunity to play um, in the sense of the communication and, and the social skills. And that was something that really came through as, as a positive finding in, in my results. Another aspect was that of the fundamental movement skills station. So again, just giving girls that opportunity to, to choose what they wanted to do, um, 
due to the nature of football, I suppose, you know, like the whole teaching games for understanding, some of it has to be pur purposeful play. Um, but giving them that element that necess wasn't necessarily football and skill related in the sense of it wasn't like following the football, hand passing the football. It was giving them even 10 minutes in that session just to experience that fun friendship side to it that, you know, some girls mightn't have had the opportunity to talk to all of the girls in the session. And that worked really, really well. So another another component that I used as part of my intervention um, was I actually I, I designed um, a ladies football and fundamental movement skill dance. So as guided by the findings, again, that fun, that friendship, you know, the low physical activity levels, the low skill mastery levels. I, I decided, OK, how am I going to try and merge all of those in to something that's I suppose, expressive and that's fun and that's engaging for, for girls? And so I decided to combine the skills of ladies football and basic fundamental movement skills with music and dance. And I used the ball as almost like the, the, the symbol. So kind of bringing in that, that whole symbolic play, using the ball as almost like a distraction in one sense, but as a focus to help them with the skills in the movement dance. Um, and I suppose the whole purpose behind the dance was to improve the, the whole kind of psychosocial side to it, the self-esteem, um, self-efficacy, um, you know, feeling good about themselves and that, that kind of feel-good factor that's often overlooked in sport and in, in coaching, in youth sport coaching, um, that was brought into it. And um, I suppose based on the findings from the focus group interviews on a coach perspective and on a child perspective, um, it was just fantastic to get such positive feedback and, and it's something that I'm actually developing because um, it, it's the perfect avenue to, to improve skills, to improve physical activity levels, but also, you know, it's that creative, the creative play is coming in that children are creative by nature and you know, they, they want that opportunity to be creative and they want that opportunity to, to trial things out and be expressive. Um, and I think, you know, I suppose in this day and age, particularly with, um, you know, I suppose technology and everything that you have this concept called surplus safety, um, whereby I suppose kids aren't even allowed to run in some schools anymore due to insurance purposes and, you know, that whole surplus safety concept. So I think by actually purposefully you know, providing a platform as a coach in a training session, even if it's only for 10 minutes of that training session, that girls actually get that opportunity to practice the skills in that social environment, because essentially that's what the research is saying. You know, they're there because they want to play. They're there because they want to be with their friends. They're there, they're there because they want to have fun and they want to better themselves. So, you know, it's that feel good factor. And I suppose I know from my own playing experience that, Sometimes it's not, I, I don't even remember what I've actually done in the training session because it's it's based on how I feel. And, you know, I think that if we can kind of instill that in coaches, that it's that feel good factor that's sometimes more important that if, if the girls or if the children are leaving the training session with a smile on their face, then like your job is, is done in, in, in one way that, you know, they're going home and they feel good about themselves. And I think that came true a lot in my research. Um, and it's important really because, that kind of social psychosocial play um in terms of creative play social play sometimes that's just neglected and it's overlooked um and it's kind of you know posing the question how can we bring that back in into coaching uh, for children because that's why they want to be there because they want to have fun so you kind of have to you know you have to kind of take a step back sometimes to to take a step forward and um, another thing that was coming through in my own research from a coaching perspective was that of um, lack of education. So it was a strong theme coming through in, in the focus group interviews was that a, a lot of coaches actually felt that they lacked confidence in the sense of, first of all, they, they weren't really sure in, in terms of what play meant and this whole kind of psychosocial element with, you know, and, and in other words, how do you actually bring fun? Like, how do you go about bringing fun into the training session? Um, so, through upskilling and through continuous professional development within the intervention that was certainly improved and after the intervention that was something that really came through in the findings is that you know even just having that assistance and having the education to actually know okay, that there's purpose behind the fund that it's not just oh 
but sure they're not doing anything they're you know just because it's a bit of chaos which Owen is going to speak about in, in a while that they're actually still learning and you need to give them that opportunity that it sometimes it can't be too structured and that was coming through in the sense that the coaches almost had that narrow-mindedness you know the old-fashioned style of but sure we always do this and we always do it this way so I'm going to continue and almost being afraid to step out of their comfort zone in the sense of you know oh god what if it why, what if it, it, it goes wrong or what if the girls don't like the game but so what if the girls don't like the game you know just try something different and I suppose you, you won't know unless unless you try um, and I think that feeds in as well I suppose from my own experience as a player over the last few years you know I've been playing football um, myself since I was nine or ten and so you know I, I'm playing a good few years now and I suppose even playing at, at an elite level and um, not only when I was a child but it's still that fun element and that kind of that creative and that social play particularly still creeps in to this day you know I mean I, I'm 27 now and I still at training it's the, the fun things that we do at training even if it's for five minutes at training you know we, we could be training for an All-Ireland final and we could be training, you know, it could be all serious at training, but it's that 10 minutes that we're, we're allowed to express ourselves and we're allowed to be instinctive. That's what I, I remember. And I think from my own playing experience um, as, a, as a footballer, um, I think the best games that I've had and in, in terms of the best scores on the pitch, the best tackles I've made, the best passes that I've made, you know, all of that came from being instinctive and having that freedom to express myself on the pitch and I suppose that's what we want to bring back into we want to bring that into into youth coaching because if you don't practice the, the instinctiveness at training and if training is too structured and too tactical and you know just too, too authoritative then you're going to kill the creativity of a player and essentially you know that instinctiveness isn't going to be you know on a high flying disc when it comes to a game situation so I think that I suppose really if anything um I do believe like from my own perspective that like obviously structure is good and you need to have a purpose behind your structure but at the same time you know that whole idea of just having a bit of chaos and having just some free time uh, some social creative uh, communicative is so important that play is so important amongst teammates um that goes a long way. And, you know, even if it's implemented in small segments throughout training, I'm not saying it has to, you know, you, you have to just let them run run wild for that 60 minutes. But if if you can, you know, give them that opportunity, they will thrive. And they will be, the, they'll have that opportunity to be their best selves in the sense that they'll be instinctive and they'll internally be motivated to want to, to put the ball over the bar. And it's all about having that experience really at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, like I mean, all in all, I suppose in, in in summary, really, I think you know there there are numerous plays, um, and there's no right or wrong answer, and every coaching style, every group is going to be different, and it's just dependent on the needs of who you, what group you have in front of you, and I suppose that one of the main kind of key messages from my own research in terms of the coaching element of it would be that of just giving it a go. And just coming out of your comfort zone a small bit and just trying something new and you know trial and error and see what works best for for your kids fantastic all that that's i mean that's really starting to set the scenes really well for the conversation we want to have uh, to have later um I've, I've taken a million pages a million notes really as you were going through uh, there's a lot of comments coming through both the the chat here and the chat on uh, on youtube um, so I'm going to, uh, thank you for that, I'm going to hand over to Owen to, to yeah. complete this setting the scene uh, and I can't wait to get chatting really. Owen, over to you. Thanks Sergio, thanks Orla. Um, thanks for this opportunity Sergio and thanks for everybody who's tuning in. Um, if you have only recently tuned in you're going to get a little surprise later on with the friend that I have here beside me. So Orla touched on a lot of her research and as, as she said she's nearly finished her research so her journey is a lot more advanced than mine is. I've only recently started mine technically with Leeds Beckett University and Sergio was actually my supervisor. So he talked a little bit about my research in terms of what I want to gain from it. And it's through sport and play. 
So children and coaches' perspectives on that. They talked about obviously the two elements of it. It's the voice of the child, you know, so investigating what are the wants and needs of the children by asking them um, and getting their feedback, whether it's them telling me through focus interviews and focus groups or writing about it, drawing it, showing me what it is. Um, so there's a little bit of the ethics that will have to be passed for that, but it's something that's extremely interesting, not only to me, but I think um, holistically in terms of my research, because it's much easier then for me to go with the second part of my research and the question of coaches' perspectives. So interviewing coaches and getting their understanding of play and what play means to them and how are they implementing play if they are at all. Um, and having done, obviously, as part of my journey in the PhD so far, I've been doing a lot of readings and kind of structuring my research now, whereas before it was 90 million questions and um, trying to figure out where I was going to go with it. And obviously Sergio and the staff at Leeds Beckett um, on the course have been hugely influential on helping me with that. So talking about some of the um, play types and through the research and all has touched on um, the, the main ones and the majority of the ones that kind of focused on my research. So locomotive play, exploratory play, imaginative play, social play, communal play, creative play, obviously, fantasy play, uh, exploratory play, rough and tumble play, role play, there's so many. Um, so what I'm trying to do in my research, in the span of my research at the start, is to look at all the different frameworks of play from not only sport, but through teaching, there's a lot in education in terms of um, continuums of play and um, how teachers and students can interact and um, learning through play, etc., and play-based learning. Um, and all of that, all of those um, frameworks, I'm building a framework for kind of the coaches and what, where I want to go with this. So like an adaptive framework. So whenever I have um, that put together, um, after reading all the other parts of theory, what I'll be doing is I have two projects that I'm going to align with my research. And one, some people will be aware is of the podcast. Um, and It'll be, a, it'll be a huge benefit, not only to me, but also to the, um, to the coaching, coaching body and the coaching movement and the global movement that hopefully I'm going to be involved with also. Then the second part is a coach development workshop of play. Again, aligned with the interviews from the children and the coaches and the framework and then putting the workshop together. So once that workshop is together, I'll be running the workshop um, and it won't be, it'll be within obviously different sporting contexts. So GA, rugby, um, football, ice hockey, hockey, doesn't matter what sport it is, because it, it'll be a generic um, of how coaches can bring play into their sessions. Um, then the last part of that will be from the, obviously the workshop and the, the feedback I get from the workshop, it'll be about then observing coaches in the field so just getting some feedback and observing them in terms of have their coaching behaviors changed from their, in their participation in the workshop and from the interviews that we've had and the talks that we've had and what they've found out about what the children have told me and what they want and what their needs are. Um, or <clears throat> as Orla touched on, it could be a lack of, lack of confidence, um, <clears throat> not having the... Um, the knowledge and understanding of how they can incorporate play into their sessions. And if they are incorporating play into their sessions, just because they are incorporating play doesn't mean that it's right or doesn't mean that it's wrong. So as Orla said, it has to be purposeful. But some of the things I'm looking at as well is that in play and as part of my readings and research, there's obviously people know about unstructured play, free play, structured play. But when you're thinking about children in play and free play is, as most people will know of it, it is free play, it's unstructured, but there's rules within that unstructured chaos, if you want. Because if you look at a two, couple of two-year-olds or a couple of three-year-olds playing with each other, they have rules. Um, if they don't fight with each other, that's a rule. They know that fighting is not good. <laughs> so that free play element, they're coming up with their own rules 
without realizing it. And in terms of the exploratory play and the imaginative play, that element of social interaction, of teamwork, of collaboration is hugely important for children. Um, and coaches, and in my experience, a lot of coaches are doing play in all their sessions. Um, and again, they mightn't realize when they're doing it, what they're doing, or what they're doing, or how they're doing it. And one of them is if they give a ball to a couple of players, go into a group, right, see, more, see what you can do. Have a go. Show us what you can do. Then making up their own games, um, being aware of even the social interaction and talking with each other. Technically, that's free play as well because it's social interaction. It's free. There's no, <clears throat> there's no rules and regulations over what they have to talk about or what they have to do. And again, play is so, it's so vast and trying to bring it back and narrow the focus in terms of what's going to impact on the coaches and how it's going to impact on them because like when you're talking about play and you're talking about um coaches in terms of their own knowledge and understanding some of them are very structured and like to have the control element which in a way depending on the needs of the children and depending on their behaviors which is one of them because free play with a group who are difficult in terms of behavior mightn't be the best solution. Um, so you might have to build up that trust with that group before you bring in play elements. So again, as Orla, Orla touched on it, it's about relationship, social interaction. Um, it's engaging and engaging with the children to increase their motivation, increase their social, social dynamic with their friends, um, being socially interactive with each other. And looking, you know, the, the, the element of play whenever you're focused on children, I mean, mostly when you think about play, it's for children, but like I know myself, I love to play. I love to have free play. I love to have less structure doing what I want. I know Sergio and Orla does. Orla talked about it in some of her coaching sessions. Still, there is an element of free play, you know, and coming up with your own games. And in terms of some of the frameworks and some of the theory behind that, there's three male elements that are going to be um, in beneficial for, you know, that I feel is for coaches. And some of the research coming back and uh, there's been a pedagogical play framework from Edwards et al. And they talk about uh, open-ended play. So basically, your free play imagination. So it's child-led. The, the coach or the teacher or the parent, they're watching over them and just making sure they're not uh, boxing ahead of each other. They're not fighting. Um, that they're being safe and that's the child-led element with obviously structure behind it because the adults are watching. Um, then the other part of that then the next part then is more collaboration with the teacher, the educator, but in my element the coach. So your model play and that could be a case of setting up setting up the teams, giving them uh, four cones in a ball and saying okay um, I want you to make up your own game but your game, you have to have passing in your game. So you'll get, you can get four different games. The first person comes up with the first game, three minutes, everybody has to play. Second person comes up with the next game, or they can add in a different rule or a different condition to the first game. So you're building up, they're building up their bank of games and you as a coach are building up your own bank of games. And then the last part of that would be as Orla touched on the purposeful frame play. So more in line with what the coach wants, but again, given the freedom and the decision-making for the players to, that the coach sets a problem, sets a game, sets a scenario, and how are the players going to deal, deal with that scenario? Whether it's added points for a defender scoring or whatever, whatever that is, or again, a specific theme or concept that the coach wants. So again, still focus on the passing, but it's more in line with what the coach wants tactically. But again, the players are coming up with it and the players are making decisions. The coach is questioning those decisions, questioning the players, and that is play. Actually, questioning a player, questioning the child is play because you're getting them to think cognitively about their behavior and what they're going to do next. So just finishing off in terms of kind of what we can do and what the research and uh, what my own experience of coaching and obviously Sergio talked about where my background and I have mostly coached four to six-year-olds 
in fairness, three to six year olds, I would say, because there's been quite a few three year olds have come in my sessions because the parents haven't had a babysitter. So they brought the younger child along and they had complete freedom, complete free play. So before I show you the video, um, there's three elements that I want to talk about in terms of what we can do. So make time for play. Um, so again, understand children's needs and wants, as we talked about. Ask them what they want to do, but try and make it um, related to purposeful and what you want as a coach to get out of the session for them to learn and take on. So again, a collaboration with the players and with the children. Um, make space for play. Obviously, you know, they need somewhere to feel free and, and safe, etc. So depending on the numbers that you have, and you'll see in this video, I have made space for play. However, it's complete organized chaos. Um, and then the last one is get involved um, yourself as a coach. Now get the players involved, but get the parents involved. And you'll see in this video, um, I'm going to explain the background behind it. Uh, it was in New York with Rockland GA around their sixes. And it was the third week and we had bigger numbers coming every week. And the amount of emails I was getting about what time it was on at, when it was on, I knew there was going to be a lot coming. I didn't know how many, but not that I was worried, but I was thinking, okay, I'm going to have to do something here. So I sent everybody an email, and in the email it said, obviously get involved in the play. So play with your own child or with another child or our coaches. You'll see our coaches. Right? Some of the children are playing completely on their own, and anybody who wasn't comfortable getting involved as a coach or helping their own child, they had to talk to a parent that they didn't know. So I'm building up that element of social interaction and play for the adults. So I'm not going to talk over this because I've explained it and hopefully you'll get what I'm, what I'm hoping for from this video. So I'll stop sharing so you can share your screen now, yeah. Yeah, and here we go. As you can see, guys, complete organized chaos. Um, but again, the purpose of that session was handling. So you can see they were catching, throwing, bouncing, but they were using their hands. And that was the show me and have a go element that we wanted for the children. It was one concept, one theme. Um, and I had obviously open-minded play. I had model play, but I had purposeful play because I knew what I wanted to get within the session. But depending on the children's needs and what they could do, was changing and I was adapting the session from what I observed. Um, so looking forward to some questions again, um, or there's a lot more advanced in hair research, but you can see how it ties in um, and how it ties in for different age groups and obviously for adults too. So um, thank you for listening. Thanks, Owen. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, you guys have thrown uh, a lot of things, uh, in, you know, people's ways. Uh, oh, hello, that's Jeannie, right? <laughs> Hi, Jeannie. How are you today? Jeannie says she's fine. She's very shy. She just talks to me. Oh, okay. It's good. I mean, it's the accent. I know the, the Spanish accent is quite imposing, really, in that sense. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to you, Jeannie. Don't worry. Um, okay. So, I mean, as, as you were, I've got two, two, two ideas, really, to discuss initially, really, and then we'll open for questions to, um, to the audience. Uh, for me, what, what first is an observation, and then I'll, I'll let you chip in on, on the observation. But um, I think when we talk about play and using play, uh, we need to be very clear about the the why. Why do we want to use play? Why is it important? Okay, and and you've hinted, you've mentioned quite a few whys, really. Um, so just to throw that back at you, really, why? Why do we need to play? What what are the benefits of a play approach, really? Uh, I'm going to go back to all that. Yeah. Well, why, why, why do we play? What, what, what's, what's your thoughts on that? Um, well, I mean, you know, if, if you pose that question to me personally, I play because, first of all, it's fun and it's enjoyable and, you know, I feel good about it. And it does, for me, come back to that feel good factor. Um, from my own research, uh, particularly, you know, the findings that have come through um, are, that, are that of the, the fun as well, the fun, fun and friendship. Um, but also, I think, of just the whole 
challenge yourself and, and getting the opportunity to, to actually challenge yourself and trial and error um, in, in a social environment. I think we're, we're social by nature um, and I think we need that social element um, you know, friends around us, coaches around us, that kind of support structure and that support system to help us as well in terms of play. But, you know, I do think that it's essentially, it boils down to like, I'm going to play because I'm, I'm going to feel better as a result of it. You know, and it really does, it, it really does boil down to that for me um, in the sense that like, I suppose it's, it's like anything in life really, you know, like if you want something or you, you want it because you feel better because you want it, you know, you, you'll feel yeah. better at the having of it. So it's the exact same thing when you, when you put it in, into coaching. Um, I know um, a coach of mine over the years, um, Eamon Ryan, he actually coached me as part of the, the all Ireland winning um, success that we've had. Um, and he always said it, you know, he always said coaching is like a business. They said that, like, you know, if you provide that feel good platform as a coach and if you provide, you know, in terms of play, you know, numerous different plays that actually will help a child blossom and will help a child feel good about themselves, then nine times out of ten, the child will want to come back to the training session. So, you know, I think essentially it boils down to that. And like the thing with play is that. You know, you're going to be improving your fundamental movement skills. You're going to be improving your skills. You're going to be improving your communication. You're going to be improving your tactics, your your whole understanding of, of whatever sport you're playing. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's just, you know, for football or for whatever sport. Playing. It's There are numerous benefits. But when you boil it down and when you filter it back down to the why, I think it's because I will feel better because of it. Thank you. So, so... Owen, what's your take on this? I mean, uh, your take or, or Jeannie's? I'm happy to hear from both. I'll we'll do yours first. Okay. <laughs> so we'll do Jeannie's. Um, Jeannie likes, you know, obviously she she thinks it's meaningful. Um, it's joyful. It's engaging for her because, as I say, as people who know Jeannie, she's not very confident. Um, she doesn't make friends very easily uh, because she looks different. Um, so the respect that she gets by interacting with other children and children coming up to her and shaking her hand and wanting her to come to the classes and come to the sessions is brilliant. But when she doesn't come to the sessions, they feel as if they're missing out because they want to know where Jeannie is. So they're bringing, you're bringing back them the care and the character of bringing in and getting children to think, not only obviously they think about themselves all the time, but think about other people and you can do that through play. Because you have to figure out, well, what is somebody else going to do or how, how, and they do that without even thinking. Um, but probably the main one is that it's an international law. So the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, it protects play as a right of children in international law. So, you know, bringing it back for that, you know, it's, it's a necessity for children and children need to play and they want to play and they will play. And with adults and, you know, adult play, what they see as play is different to the children and vice versa. So it's trying to bring in that communication and collaboration between both. Um, and obviously it's not only good for children to play, but it's good for adults because it takes you out of your comfort zone. You're learning about your own coaching or your own teaching, how your sessions are going. It gives you an opportunity, <coughs> excuse me, gives you an opportunity to, try something out, <clears throat> excuse me, a new game or a new concept. Um, and we talked about, we talked about this a lot and we talked about this um, kind of before is when you're coaching, when you're teaching, when you're a parent, you're going to make mistakes and that's fine. That's okay. And having that element of trying something new, have a go and you will know, you'll know what it feels like when you're playing, when children are playing, they know how it feels. It's that intrinsic motivation for them. You know, you're absorbing their attention, for want of a better word. They're engaging with them. They're engaging with their friends, builds their confidence. But again, it comes back to the free play, the open-ended. It has to be then you can model it, um, kind of thinking about <clears throat> collaborating with the child. But then there has to be a purpose behind the play, as Orla said. And, you know, the research in terms of the fun, uh, the fun integration theory, Amanda Visek and Hal Maddox, it's not fun for the sake of fun. It's what intrinsically motivates children, <clears throat> what intrinsically motivates youth to play. 
um, and all the elements <clears throat> that comes out of that. So there has to be a purpose behind it because learning is fun. So the fun element is extremely important and children, if they have that full element, if they are to engage in a lot, they're learning, sometimes they're learning without realizing it. And it's about bringing that back to what is your focus as a coach? What is your theme for that session? And how are you going to implement that? And without the didactic telling, 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 mm -hmm. question them, give them an opportunity to make mistakes, to, to make decisions, to play with their friends, to interact with each other. And again, just to build deep and powerful relief. And that's, uh, I mean, you, you've, you're bringing together quite a few things there, really. But to me, one, one thing that strikes me really strongly is the idea of normally, I mean, nowadays, when we talk about play in youth sports, um, I think a lot of the times we focus the debate around the idea of uh, a games-based approach to coaching versus a, um, a, a drills-based approach. Uh, but what I'm getting from you is that play is about much more than learning the game. The play is not just used as a way to learn the more tactical elements of the game or the decision making of the game. The game has a benefit in itself for the human being, right? That, that's, that's what we're getting at here, okay? Is that right, yeah? Yeah. Mm. yeah. And so in that, I mean, in that sense, when you, as a coach, when you make a decision to incorporate play into your sessions, um, you are going beyond the idea I'm just making them better players. You are making them better people, yeah. okay? Yeah. Uh, but what really struck me as well uh, from what you said is that there are a million ways to play. And, mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if, if any, any of you would like to talk a bit more about, you know, the, the repertoire of, of things that we can do to incorporate play, really. And, and it's not just about playing games. It's not just about, uh, as you said, all that. Uh, letting them room wide for 55 minutes. Okay, so g give me a bit more around how, how in practical ways, w w I mean, you mentioned communicative play, social play, family play, rock and tumble, role play, locomotive, imaginative play. Uh, help the people listening to the webinar put the, you know, get a, get a picture of what, was, what that looks like a little bit. Um, I think you kind of you made a, an important point there um, it, saying how you need to kind of get to know them as people first um, and players second and I think that's really important and I know Owen had touched off that that like you you f the first step really is you just need to get to know your players um, and you need to ask your players you know what do you like essentially because every group of, of players is going to be different they're going to have different likes different dislikes you know, so you have to adapt to their needs. And I think getting to know them as people first, finding out what they want and what they like, I think that's the first step. And then I think Owen had mentioned it as well, is that having that purpose, like what do you want to get out of the session? You know, is there something that you need to work on? Maybe it's skill-based, maybe it's the communication side of things, maybe it's um, whatever element of the session that like you need to have a, a purpose and a common goal amongst the coaches and amongst the players and it has to be collaborative as well and um, you know obviously that's going to change from you know youth sport all the way up to adulthood you know we, the players might have more of a say when I know we from my own experience we would have a lot in terms of making calls both on and off the pitch at a senior level but in terms of youth sport you still need to communicate with your players and find out what they want um, and trial and error I think like you know like I do think a balance of everything like like I think having a, a coach-led and a child-led session and um, having the balance is key you know you don't want to be too authoritative um, but at the same time you don't want to just you know have no structure at all at all for the whole session so I think having a balance once you know your players and once you know what they like I think you can gauge that off them um, but I do think having the, the purpose really purposeful planning and a purpose behind everything you do in the training like you know even in the warm-up you know why are you doing this what are they getting out of it you know as a team collectively um so that you can better the players and you, you you can help in terms of their motivation and their skill because that will come that that will be derived from their own personal motivation um, and intrinsic motivation um but i do think in terms of like resources and in terms of you know approaches um whether that be like a teaching games to understanding approach or whatever approach you're using that trial and error see what works 
um, and adapt. Like adaption is key in terms of coaching based on their needs um, and giving them a voice, like giving them voice and allowing them to express themselves um, allowing that free time, allowing them to interact with each other in a social environment. I know from my own um, experience, like there's some days I would go to training and I might kind of say to myself, geez, did I talk to Emma? I didn't, I don't know, did I even see Emma? She was at training, but I mightn't have even, even interacted with her in the training session. And the training session could have been an, an hour and a half long, you know, and I mightn't have actually had time to interact with five or six of the players so you know it's how do you go about as a coach how do you go about different ways that you can get that full interaction with the players and that they enjoy themselves doing it as well so it's kind of merging different things but you have to take a step back to go forward so get to know your players first see what they like trial and error um, and it's just a matter of being adaptive then as well love that you know get to know your players and then try things Okay, I mean, Ola, you mentioned something that I'm going to pass on to Owen. Because uh, Owen, I don't know, the majority of your work has been with, with younger children, okay? But play is not just for children, okay? And, and Ola was talking about her own, you know, as a professional player uh, and, and as an elite player that she, she still enjoys play, okay? So how, how, how do we, Owen, how do we change? Or does it change, really? How do we play at different ages? How do we adapt play to different ages? I suppose in my own experience, so I'm going to kind of focus on some of the elements of play and give some examples of kind of practical examples that I've used in my own experience. <clears throat> so I talked a little bit earlier on about, you know, knowing your players and Orla talked about that too. So building relationships. When I first, um, obviously when we first started with Ulster GA and we did a lot of in service, and there's a couple of people, Theresa McNabb, um, et cetera, and on this um, webinar, who was one of my colleagues, we did a lot of in service and we did a lot of training and we interact with each other. We tried things out as a group before we went into schools. And that was our education, um, which was hugely beneficial because it showed that we could try things out. And we were doing child games, but we were adults and but if I was coaching my peers, they were acting like children. So, and you can imagine what adults do if they're trying to act like children, what would happen in the session. So uh, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, kind of related to, you know, what we would see in school. It was kind of over and above what we would see in school and how will we handle it? Um, so when we went in then into schools and there was a couple of classes I'll always, I'll always remember. And one of them was a group of, 24 and there was 18 boys and about six seven eight girls which was complete organized chaos um and it came down to safety so when i talked earlier on about the theories um so there was very little open-ended play because if i had an open-ended play the boys would fall they'd punch each other they would play and tag all they wanted to do was not hurt each other but they were extremely rough and tumble uh, then a little bit, I would collaborate with them a little bit um, in terms of what they wanted, but not too much because I know the lesson would just fall around me if I did that. Yeah. So it was very much coach-led, but I would be setting up the games and activities. They would be doing them, and then I'd be going over the group, seeing how they're getting on. If they're doing well, then I'll give them an extra condition, a harder condition, or I'll make it a little bit easier. Um, the props, as Skip and Jeannie, they come in in terms of the younger elements, so um, children who are shy or who are not con not as confident as their classmates or their peers, these two hoodlums really helped me in terms of getting them involved in the sessions and getting them involved in physical activities. Um, and again, it was coach-led, but they had two new friends because Jeannie was shy and, um, and didn't enjoy PE most of the time because she thought she wasn't good at it. Um, so it was bringing it back in terms of wasn't about the physical skills and the fundamental movement skills. It was about the motivation, the understanding. So bringing that physical literacy element um, aside from the competence. In terms then of adults, and Orl has touched on it too. So, you know, you would still have social play when you're with an adult team because, you know, getting them, and I would still do it with adults, children of any age and any ability, giving them 
cones in the ball and seeing what they come up with. And then me putting my take on it, okay, I want you to focus on handling or kicking or passing or, you know, jumping and catching, whatever it is. But I always have one constant theme throughout a P session or a coaching session, which makes it easier then for me to change the session, to make it a little bit harder, more challenging, or to bring it back a step for a couple of the um, players and children who are more difficult um and that's the model place of the collaboration between them it's it's a complete minefield a little bit too so your locomotor play for example in terms of the types um your movement moving in any direction and any pathway any way they want and doing sequencing so you're having the children move about and they're all running around and then and it happens with adults if you don't kind of make it a little bit harder, change it up, everybody will run around the circle. <laughs> so, um, and then you're saying change pathway, change direction. And we want you doing two things at once. And then the imaginative play. So bringing in music. So the jungle book, for example, they have to move like their favorite animal in the jungle. Um, you're bringing in, you can bring in levels, low, medium, high. So a big bear, high, reaching for the sky, a snake low down the ground, crawling. Um, you know, slow, medium, fast, different speeds. So that locomotor and imagine play can come together. Um, exploratory play then. So you're getting them to think about information. So again, setting up a game and getting them to figure out maybe what they need to do to get past the defenders or to get width in their, in their play or to get more movement in their play. So, you know, you're getting them to think about it. But again, that depends on the space that you have and the space that you're giving them. Um, and then the, the areas then next are the communication, the creative play, the uh, social play that coaches are doing. Um, obviously, some do it more than others. But in the terms of the social play, you're just getting them to think about their own rules, criteria, and they're doing that because depending on the ability of the group or the behavior on the group, um, that will change and there's there's classes and it's happened in obviously in my previous role with Ulster GA in New York with Rockland in the club but also in the school so I was in uh, the school system in New York too in Lincoln Elementary and the, when I was getting to know the children it was complete organized chaos because I wanted to see what they could do but I was confident in my own ability to change things up or to give more yeah yeah yeah. and again that's confidence and that's trial and error and that's having a go and that's education and that's where i'm where i'm hoping to bring my research in terms of the theory and then the education of the workshop and the podcast and then observing coaches in the field to see if they're changing their own behaviors the environment or if they find it too challenging and if they need an extra little bit of help but Mm -hmm. it'll be constantly adapting all the time the theory my own coaching my reflections and that's what that's what everybody should be doing is thinking critically about what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're doing it. But have you, you've touched on two things that that actually we had a couple of questions related to that from the audience that, that I'm going to throw over to Orla really because one of the yeah. questions was, uh, okay, sometimes it looks like we have to make a choice between having fun and winning, okay? But mm-hmm. Orla, you were saying that that you had a lot of fun while you were winning as well and winning oh, yeah. at the highest level, right? Because um, the question was around whether your coach, Eamon Ryan, would have coached in a play way. Um, <laughs> and that, because, he, again, it's not, it's not all about uh, having fun and games all the time. It's just finding that balance that you talked about. Okay, talk about your experience of play as, a, as, a, as, a, as an elite athlete, okay, and, and what your coach did. Yeah, um, so I suppose, um, well, in in this in sense of Eamon Ryan, um, he would have been our coach for about eight, eight, eight to ten years, I think. Um, so we would have had the same coach over the few years, but you know, now looking back, when I look back on my memories of playing uh, and winning all Ireland's, um, it's the it's this training sessions whereby we had that you know collaborative communication between the players, you know, even things like team challenges. I know um, a part of the the training session would have been the team challenge aspect, where you know, even if it was just for five minutes. At the end of training or at the start of training and um, we always had that element of um, interaction amongst each other and coming up with our own conclusions 
So um, team challenges would have been an, a, a big element as part of the training session. But I think as well, interestingly enough, it's, it's what we did off the pitch as well, I think um, has stood to us over the years. So, you know, as much as like, when I talk about fun, I'm not talking about like, like there is a purpose behind the fun too. Um, and like that, that has come through over the years. Um, and I know that from even winning the All-Irelands, like winning the six All-Ireland medals, I was saying to, 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 to a while ago that, you know, it, it's not the medals that I, I don't even know where my medals are. It's the memories and the fun and the friendships that I've made as well. But I do think specifically in terms of play, like it definitely comes into the social play and the communicative play, and but also the kind of exploratory play. Like, I suppose coaches my coaches over the years always would have had given us an opportunity to to come up with our own conclusions in terms of scenario based play and so um may, maybe based on previous games that we've played or how we're going at training at the moment um or a certain situation you know like for example blanket defense if if the other team have been if that's their goal you know how are we going to react to that so we we would have been just thrown into that at training and being like right as, as players, what are we going to do? So it's kind of that exploring and that exploratory play as well, but also having that social interaction, I think, has led us internally motivated over the years. Um, but I think that has a knock-on effect because I know when I came on the panel, I was only 17. So I was actually still a minor at the time and I was still playing minor football at the time. So I, I was 17 and I was playing under 18 minor football and I was also playing senior football so it was a big it was a big gap and it, there was a big mm -hmm. I was a big jump from minor to senior too but um, I think having that exploratory kind of aspect to the training um, definitely had that knock on effect from all the players it's like almost like a buy-in from all the players um, and had that knock on effect over the years so um, like, I mean there's as I said every training is going to be different every group is going to be different but based on my own experience that's what I remember is that fun kind of um, instinctive instinctful but allowing the coach allowed for that almost give, give, he gave us the facts but we came up then with our own con conclusions um, for the majority of the training session Thank you Orla and I, I, I want to make a comment there. Um, our friend Pablo from Argentina, who is watching the live, the, the, the webinar from Argentina, and he's very early in the morning there as well, I see. Um, he's saying that we also have to redefine what winning means, depending on the age of the players, okay, and the stage of development. So that we, you know, with, with children, winning is that they keep coming. Okay, that's the main thing, really. So that's an interesting point. Um, I was also gonna, uh, I know we talked about this um, when, you know, when we were off camera earlier on today before we went live. Uh, the idea of, I'm gonna mean it, you, I know you mentioned this before that the coaches uh, didn't feel confident to use a play approach. But we also need to understand that, you know, using a play approach or using play in your coaching doesn't mean that you have to be a professional comedian or a clown, okay? Um, so. I'm going, to, I'm going to go back to Owen a little bit there in that sense of, uh, Owen, not everybody has to use puppets to use play in a, you know, if they're not confident to that, you can use play in, in other ways, right? Yeah, definitely, Sergio. And um, <clears throat> this is something that, you know, we would have worked on a lot within also GAs um, in terms of the club development and the coach development aspect of the role as well. But also we would have done a lot of that with Rockland GA in New York. So, most all the coaches within Rockland were, um, and a lot of the new ones were new parents. Um, so trying, to, it was a case of getting them to just become to have a go at something, um, and not to feel as if everything had to be right. That they would plan their session, just be aware of their own concept and theme that they wanted to think about, but one thing at a time for them, um, and it would make their job easier, make their coaching easier. Um, and it would allow them to focus on one thing rather than the chaos of a game and thinking about hand and kick and strike and whatever it is, attacking, defending, all the tactical elements and the psychological elements and the social elements, one thing at a time. Um, so that was one of the things that we pushed because a lot of the clubs, and it's the same in any sport and any volunteers who are involved and parents who are involved, 
seven, eight, nine times out of ten, you're coaching your own children, and you're the first, they're their probably first coach. <laughs> so getting them to think about, as I said, one thing at a time, but not to be afraid to make mistakes, you know, and it, all this, all these puppets and all the um, not being afraid to be a clown, and I am a bit of a clown, and anybody <laughs> That and obviously, Sergio, you know that probably more than others, and Orla's got to know that recently. Um, <laughs> but some of my sessions, I will act, I am an actor in terms of when I'm coaching children, especially because um, you have to play that role. You know, you can't play the ogre. You might have to sometimes, depending on the behavior of some of the children. Um, but some of the times, I will do a skill or a concept completely wrong on pure purpose. And I will do it wrong completely. And I just want to see if they laugh at me, then I'll say, well, why are you laughing at me? That's how I do it. And then they'll say, that's not how you do it. That's silly. Say, okay, okay, you tell me how to do it. You show me how you do it. And then they'll show me. Some of them will show me. Some of them won't be able to. Mm -hmm. But then those players, I'll either make them captains within the group or I'll mix ability so then they can be a little bit of like mini coaches for me. Yep. Um, so I'm getting to know the children, getting to know their behaviours, getting to know, you know, are they confident to do that? Others won't be. And I've made the mistake of asking somebody to do something or asking them a question, a specific question. Or can I ask you a question? And they'll say yes. And then I ask the question and they just curl up. They don't want to ask it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the parents and the new coaches coming in and not being a cloud, three things. Have a go at it. Um, if your session goes completely out the window in the first five minutes, that's okay. That always happens to me all the time. Nine times out of 10, there's parts of the session I've planned and I'm not going to do that because I've seen something and then think, oh, I'm going to focus more on this because it's related to what I want to do, make it a little bit harder, bring it back a little bit. Um, <coughs> but one of the easiest things for the parents, and again, when you get to know your players and uh, is asking them, putting them in groups and saying, listen, here's the equipment you have, here's the area you have, make up your own games, see what they come up with. And you're more of a facilitator, making sure they're not misbehaving, making sure they're on task. If they're finding it too easy, then go over to that group and make it a little bit harder or stop it and change it up. Um, so a lot of it is trial and error. Have a go and you and know. You know how it feels. You know, you don't have to be an experienced coach and nine times out of 10, a lot of, a lot of new coaches are parents. So it's giving them the confidence because you want that conveyor belt the whole way through. You want as many children, as, um, as many children all the time, as many as possible for as long as possible. But the same for the coaches. You know, you want as many as possible to give you the help to run the club, to help run the teams, to help run, be volunteers and help with events and et cetera. So it's bringing people along on that journey and yeah. helping them as much as you can. And that's where these type of webinars and stuff are so important because we're the biggest resource we have for each other. So asking That's a good questions. early now, yeah. Yeah, asking questions and getting involved um, and asking people how you would do things or, you know, and then trying it out for yourself. I mean, Owen, you, again, you've mentioned one thing that came through in one of the questions. So, so Trish uh, was asking, well, I've just started coaching uh, Olympic handball with four to seven-year-olds. Um, it's the first time that I've done this. I didn't know anything about Olympic handball until a year ago. Um, and I'm finding it difficult because sometimes children uh, seem to get distracted really easily. So that's my dog, by the way. Is, uh, that's another another type of play. Uh, <laughs> that means the uh, the postman or Amazon is here. Uh, but you know, how do we? What do we say to coaches like like Trish that are starting to coach this age group, and and they realize that you know sometimes the sessions are not as pretty as you want them to be. Again, if uh, I would say to that, if they're coming back and there's more children coming back, they're telling their friends, you're putting it out there that the sessions are on, um, you're interacting with the community to say that obviously Trish is the first coach. She's working with four, four to seven year olds, you said, Sergio, yeah. in the Olympic handball. So having, having her, it's important that obviously she has support as well within the club, but also within a coaching team. I don't know if she is on her own. I obviously, I, would hope not that she would have a little bit of support in terms of um, another coach or another parent along with her, just for crowd management more than anything. <laughs> because if you have 
you know, we don't know many she has. If you have 15 or 20 at a session and you're the only coach, you shouldn't be in terms of child protection. You know, you need that help with you. You need that support for yourself as well. Um, so Tracy just replied on the chat that she, uh, there's only one her and another coach, another parent. Okay. Well, again, it's, <clears throat> it's about, I would ask them <clears throat> how they interact with each other. So do they sit down and have a plan about what each of them are going to do? So if each of them does half the group, takes half the group each and then rotates the two groups, or if they are engaging with parents, if the parents have to stay at that age group, I would be advocating for parents to stay at the session to get involved, like you've yep. seen in the video. Because um, then you can go over and in terms of behavior, um, a parent does not want their child to be sent over to them when they're at a session. <laughs> so yeah. if it happens once, six, seven times out of 10, it's not going to happen again because the parent will be a little bit embarrassed. Um, yeah. There's another aspect that you will probably get, you will probably get parents if they're staying, the, that are just chomping at the bit to get involved. Ask them to give you help. Ask them to, if you're setting up the stations that I would have done a lot and we would have done a lot with Ulster GA and Rockland and I know Arl has done it in our research in terms of Gaelic for girls. Mm -hmm. Having six or seven stations, little help for each station, letting everybody know what um, skill or what concept is going to be done in the station. Coach, parent stays at that same station. The first time they do it, they'll be a little bit overawed. The second group that comes to them, all yeah, trying to think about getting them to think, okay, well, that first group, I might change it up for the second group, or I didn't like the way that worked, so I might ask them a question. Or, and again, it's trial and error, and it's building the confidence as they go along, because there's, there's still groups that I take, and there's groups that I have always had, even when I was in schools in New York and in, um, in Fermanagh, was you're going there, and you know it's going to be bedlam. You know they're not going to be listening to you, you know uh, they're mightn't, they mightn't be taken on, they mightn't enjoy it as much um, because whether it's in the school or whether they've been brought there, they have to go there because the parent wants to get involved in the club. So that can, that's a difficult dynamic and that's where you need to work with your coaches yourself and think about how you're going to help each other because a lot of the stuff that I would um, advise for that element in terms of behaviour would be the purposeful play. So more yeah. coach-led um, and coach sets everything up coach gets them to play the games, play the activities, but ask them questions and um, ask them, uh, why are you doing that? Or how are you doing this? Or how could we change this children? How, how would you change the game? That's play, that's social play, that's communicative play. Yeah, but I would um, say to Trish as well, Trish, don't, you, you, uh, when you're coaching children of that age, hmm. and in general, when you're coaching, you have to drop the illusion of control. I call it the illusion oh, yeah. of control, yeah. because it doesn't exist. You know, we want to be in control. We want everything to be pretty. And and it doesn't work like that with children, okay? And we have to be comfortable in in allowing that, that level of chaos and level of fluidity because that's where good things happen, really. That's yeah. where the good stuff is going to happen. Yeah. Um, and in, and, in, and, in, and in, I've just seen in the chat there, um, Chris has put in about um, selling it to parents and coaches. So we would have done with... Um, in Rockland, GA, New York, and one of the things I know that um, in Dublin and a lot of other sports, engaging the parents um, and engaging the coaches because you have to have a, a structure and a, a framework for your club or your, um, especially for your club, because it has to be a pathway for the players. And, you know, if, if everybody's aware of what's expected of them, why they're doing this, why they're having a, why we're having a developmental approach over a coach led winning approach. Yeah. Um, that it's for um, having more, more, more players, more children, more volunteers um, involved in the club, not only as coaches, but to run the club, to run the events, to be um, involved in the shop at the club or, you know, bringing, um, making sandwiches for yeah. games or whatever. And it is. I, I think on that point as well, Owen, like from my own experience, like Gaelic for Girls, um, there's a parental component as well yeah. to the programme. Right. And, yeah. you know, one thing that we did, sometimes it's just a matter of just asking, mm -hmm. you know, like it's some of the parents actually felt, God, I don't know what I'd be good enough to to train or to do this it's it's that lack of confidence of parents too but if you can bring them in sometimes you know particularly if there's only two coaches there for in Trisha's scenario that like if you can just bring them in and and add a station or maybe do water or maybe collect cones so that you're giving them 
you're allowing them to be comfortable by observing the session first and interacting with the parents that you know it'll build it'll help to build up their confidence and then as a result they might decide to you know go on and do a coaching education program where they might get involved in the club but even if they don't want to get involved in the coaching specifically you know as Owen was saying there are you know admin roles there are numerous roles that that can create that kind of community practice as well so it's trying to get the parents on board as well and sometimes it all it takes is just to communicate and just to ask and you know the worst they can say is no exactly yeah, yeah. don't ask you don't get yeah. <laughs> and in that sense you know i think i think the parents are key in general not, not only for play but in, when, you're, when you're coaching really I, I always say when you take on coaching a group of children kids you're taking on coaching the parents as well and because yeah. you want to bring them along along on, on the journey mm-hmm. really and they can support you so much they, they are they are the biggest resource they're not the enemy uh we need to really treat them like a one of us someone that can help us uh and that goes you know tandy was making a comment around that has to be part of the philosophy and the vision yeah. of the club um chris from the us was saying you have to sell it to, to to the parents you have to get them to understand why why we're playing so so everybody has to be on board a lot of this the issues that we get sometimes in coaching are, are down to a lack of communication really people not really understanding what you're trying to do because it looks different to what coaching has looked in the past Okay, uh, I'm gonna wrap it up with one final question because we've been going now for an hour and ten minutes, and I know people have to get back to work and, and things like that, or to homeschooling as well. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, using play can be can be learned. You know, coaches can learn to use play more often or to be more comfortable, right? So, all that you, you, you developed a, a, a coach development intervention as part of your your studies. Just take us to that a little bit again and what were the keys really to get these coaches to feel more comfortable using play or, or coaching in a particular way? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you just an example. Um, so one element of my, my research, um, I designed and choreographed the dance. So that was something that came through in the findings and the coaches actually were heavily involved in the, the dancing movement fundamental movement skills slash dance um and actually at the start um they were quite hesitant and because it was something new and because it was out of their comfort zone a good bit you know some some of the coaches weren't very comfortable with dance um but because they could see the benefits and because the girls wanted it um they decided to to actually get involved so um as part of the research, I, I would have had conducted some workshops, so some coach education and, you know, continuous professional development over the 10 weeks of the intervention, um, which helped the coaches in terms of education and support. So that support structure was there. But at the same time, I I, I didn't want to be, you no, know, I wanted them to have the onus. Um, so they, they actually, I provided the dance, um, choreographed uh, electronically, and they... They took the dance um, and they just they they trained the girls and they they showed the girls and then they allowed the girls to come up with their own moves um, and at the very end of the program um, they actually performed the dance and um, the coaches with the girls and the parents so again it just kind of created that fun social aspect and um, and you know it really just raised the spirits in the club uh, for the players for the parents everyone was happy essentially um, but I think. I think that was a real eye opener for me in the sense of that lack of educate or a lack of confidence uh, for the coaches that like even you could even tell by their body language um, they got so into it and like at the start they were God I, I don't know what I'd be able to do that now at all and then after about four or five weeks they were immersed in in the dance and you know they were doing and they, they were sending videos to each other and you know there were there was just a, a a good momentum and a positive momentum um with the dance so i think like again it, it goes back to owen's point like about you know if you don't try you'll never know like and you sometimes you just have to to go for it um you know like dance the reason why i picked dance is because well, for girls, particularly girls love to dance and, and girls want to have fun. And it's the perfect avenue to in, increase skill as well. So you have the kind of locomotive play as well there. Um, you have the creative play, you have the communicative play. You know, you're exploring and you're expressing yourself through dance. And you have that fluidity of movement as well, um, as well as having fun. So um, I think, you know, 
I suppose from my own experience of the program, it was it was really, really positive. Um, and it's something that I'm actually developing now in the, in schools and in, uh, I suppose, national government bodies for sport as well, so sporting organisations as well. Um, and I'm really excited because, you know what, sometimes it just comes down to that lack of education and that lack of knowledge and um, just taking that risk and um, just taking that leap and taking that risk. And um, I think all coaches should should just go for it and try out new things, particularly be, for, for children, because, you know, our bodies are designed to move and, you know, by nature, we're designed to play. And, you know, why would we leave that out of a training session? Like, if anything, that should be the, the bread and butter of the training session, because, you know, that's the purpose. That's the main purpose behind it. And if you can if, if you can have that as the foundation, it's like kind of a pyramid. If you, you know, there's no point in working on all the skills and this and that if you don't have a solid foundation. So you need to have that purpose um, and education will help build up then through the, the pyramid as well. Brilliant. I mean, I'm going to finish on that note. We are designed to play. So why would we leave it out? OK, um, <laughs> listen, I'm just going to finish by Thanking um, Ola and Owen for giving us their time and expertise today. It's been a, a, an exciting session and, and lots of takeaways, really. I'm going to thank also everybody that joined us on YouTube and, and on Zoom uh, from all over the world. Okay, I'm going to thank Jeannie and Skip as well for, for making an <laughs> appearance. Um, and I'm just going to, as you see on the, uh, on the slide now, uh, I'm going to encourage you guys to, to continue the discussion, uh, to continue... Uh, learning more about all of this to go to our youtube channel the iCoach kids youtube channel where we have our, over 120 videos on different topics around coaching children to maybe sign up to one of our three free e-learning courses to go on our website and look at the blogs just to follow us on social media and and help us spread the word okay so on that note um orla owen thank you so much uh, i'll see you soon and i'll, I'll uh, yeah thank you for everything you've done for us today okay and thanks everybody well thanks done everybody. everybody see Take you care, soon guys. thank you see ya bye bye